Thanks, Janet. So after I graduated college a little over a decade ago, I spent a year as a volunteer elementary school teacher in the Marshall Islands, Central Pacific, sort of halfway between Hawaii and Australia. And I was definitely looking for this quest for you know, this thrill-seeking travel opportunity that a lot of young people are, this quest for the most remote, most difficult to access place on the planet, probably every parent's nightmare. Um, and the year I spent there really had a, a profound impact on my life. I think it set in motion a trajectory that ultimately landed me here in Providence, in Rhode Island, where I now find myself transporting, talking about, digging through tons and tons of food waste. And before we take things full circle and connect back to that, I want to start us off really on that tropical Pacific island, the island of Eniwetok. So this is the northwesternmost atoll in the Marshall Islands, a horseshoe-shaped ring of about 40 islands, two square miles of landmass, population of less than 1,000. And from the air and on the ground, really a tropical paradise, but with a much more complicated history. Um, in 1947, the United States government relocated all the residents of Eniwetok to prepare for a series of nuclear tests to be conducted on the islands. And between 1947 and 1958, there were 42 nuclear tests conducted in Eniwetok Atoll. The mic blast pictured here was one of the most powerful and actually vaporized one of the islands completely. Created a two-thirds of a mile hole in the ocean. And when the United States decided before it resettled residents of Eniwetok back on the islands, the US government scraped about 73,000 cubic meters of surface soil from the six southernmost islands. And to give you an idea of the equivalent volume of that, it's about 30 Olympic swimming pools full of soil. So that is a huge amount of soil. And the US government told Anawita community that essentially because of that surface scraping, it would be impossible for local residents to ever grow food on the islands again. So from that point forward, they would be completely dependent on imported food, mostly canned food, provided courtesy of the US Department of Agriculture. And luckily, the Eniwetok residents didn't listen. They started working with an agricultural specialist who'd worked across the Pacific, a, a man by the name of Franco Matariki. And Franco had this interesting philosophy, which was, we can't change history, but we absolutely can create a mechanism for making life better. And Franco, as an agricultural specialist, looked at Eniwetok and said, if we're going to start growing food on the island, we need to start by growing soil. And that was the early 1990s. By the time I arrived in 2003, the agriculture program on the island had really taken off. And we talked was growing coconuts, breadfruit, papaya, guava, lime, lemon, banana. And the proof was really in the breadfruit pudding on this, that in a, in a matter of less than a decade, you basically had a conversion where the numbers that I had seen, five times as many breadfruit trees like the one pictured here, 25 times as many fruit-bearing coconut trees, 100 times as many pandanus trees, which I promise you is actually a real tropical fruit. And the time that I spent on Eniwetok, in that moment, I didn't really fully understand the implications of what I was seeing on the island until I actually came to a different island, Rhode Island, and, and started working, as Janet mentioned, for an organization called the Southside Community Land Trust that for over 30 years in Providence has been converting vacant lots and abandoned properties into thriving community gardens and urban farms. And when I first came to Providence, and saw photos of what the area looked like in the early 1980s, and saw these boarded up, burned out houses, 
and vacant, trash-filled lots. And as I came and saw what was happening during the recession, same thing, trash-filled lots. I had this sense of deja vu that just as I'd seen in Enoetok, I was looking at land and soil that had been just absolutely devastated. And in both cases, the silver lining was there was this community commitment. This commitment that one load of compost at a time, we could transform the mistakes of the past and rebuild healthy soil and healthy communities. And I thought back to something that Franco said again, which is, we can't change history, but we can absolutely create a mechanism for making life better. And at the Land Trust, the mantra was actually very similar. Healthy soil grows healthy plants. Healthy plants feed healthy people. And I learned it from the head grower at Southside Community Land Trust City Farm, Rich Peterson, one of the best urban growers I've seen. He learned it from a rural West Virginia farmer named Johnny Spangler. But the implications of that statement for all of us are pretty profound. The estimates are that by the middle of the century, two-thirds of the population of the world will be living in cities or urban areas. And so the question that we really need to all be asking ourselves is, how can we start to transform cities in this way? And how can we start to turn trash-filled lots or abandoned properties into thriving, healthy systems? And I think when we start to connect people to healthy soil and healthy plants, we really do create healthier communities in every sense of the word. But we have this common misperception about how plants and soil interact. And I think we think of it as plants grow in soil and they just take up nutrients. And that's then the nutrients that are available to us. And what we miss in that is that there's actually this whole complex relationship between plants and their roots and, and soil. That there's a whole community of living things that live in and around plant roots. Bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa. All these things, plants are actually dependent on them because these are the things that break down nutrients and make them available to plants. And the incredible thing about that relationship is it works both ways. That these communities are dependent on each other to thrive and to survive. And that plants don't just passively let this happen, plants actually exude, they're called exudates, they exude proteins so that they can encourage things like certain bacteria to thrive that then help plants access nutrients that they need. And it's this beautiful symbiotic relationship, but we tend to simplify it. And I don't use the word community when I talk about soil unintentionally. There really is a whole community in live soil. And I mentioned some of the things before, but you can see. I mean, these are different shapes and sizes and colors. But these things that are living in soil have one thing in common with each other and with all of us. They're totally dependent on one another and for us for survival. And that we have the opportunity to model these systems and to think in the same way that our soil communities are thriving dynamic, how can we start to create healthy and dynamic communities of people. And the unfortunate thing, if we think about how do we start to build soil systems that are healthy and alive in this way, the answer to that actually is, for the most part, sitting in our trash cans and in our landfill. Rhode Islanders send about 150,000 tons of compostable waste, food waste, soiled paper, things like that, to the landfill every year. And I think that's crazy enough. What to me is even crazier is Rhode Island has one landfill. It's literally called the central landfill. And so we're sending all these nutrients by the ton. We're burying them in basically a giant hole and they have no secondary benefit to us. 
They're not coming back. They're gone forever. And that to me means we have a waste problem in the state and in this country, and we need to shift the way we're thinking about waste. This is my friend Rob who shot the video on top of the landfill. So about a year and a half ago, my business partner, Nat Harris, and I incorporated the compost plant. And it was built on this idea that that transformation is possible. That if we start to pull those nutrients out of going to landfill and convert them into soil, not only do we solve this waste problem that Rhode Island has, but we also respond to an exciting growth in Rhode Island. We're seeing an agriculture in the state an agricultural system in the state, and a sector that's growing. We're seeing more farms, but uniquely a lot of them are less than 10 acres. They're fairly small in size. They're near urban and suburban areas. And the lesson I learned from working at the Land Trust is, if you're growing food intensively on small parcels of land, you're pulling a lot of nutrients out of the soil, and you have to have something that's going to replenish that soil and keep the soil and plants healthy. And so the compost plant was founded on this idea that this is a huge opportunity in the state. And so about a year ago, we started collecting food waste, 50 gallons at a time, from restaurants, universities, hospitals. And what you're about to see is, this is wet, sloppy, heavy material. Right? A lot of people look at this video and think, Oh my God, this is disgusting to watch. I actually love showing it to elementary schools because as that bin goes up the lifter and before it dumps into the truck, there's this kind of rumble of anticipation as students see what's about to happen. And then as soon as this kind of vomits into the truck, there's just this explosion of like laughter and shouting. And one of the things that I, I tell people when I show them this video is that slop, that wet slop, that is the perfect food for this whole community of life that lives in soil. And that's the opportunity that we have now. So since we began in a little over a year, the compost plants diverted about 200,000 gallons of food waste, which weighs somewhere around 400 tons. And we are just barely skimming the surface of what's possible. And believe me, there are moments when I'm standing mid-calf deep in unidentifiable fish waste and fruit and vegetable waste, and I think to myself, why am I doing this? But this business was built on this vision of transformation. It's the same transformation I saw in Enuitoc over a decade ago. It's the same transformation that I've seen in Providence for the last decade. And it's a transformation that I think is possible in cities and towns all over the country, but it requires us to start thinking differently about how we view waste. It's not waste. It's a community and an environmental resource if it's turned into that. And when we think about waste as food, food for this whole microscopic bi biological community in soil, that then is going to turn that into food for our tomato plants, our pepper plants, our gardens and farms, and ultimately is going to turn that into food for Rhode Island families. And when we think about it that way, it starts to really shift our mentality. And businesses like the compost plant, yes, I think it's green manufacturing. This is a new form of local manufacturing. This is green business development. This is green jobs. But on a more fundamental scale, I think this is fucking alchemy. <laughs> this is turning waste into black gold. And you're probably getting the impression that I fall into the category of a little bit of a soil nerd. Janet mentioned that my wife often makes fun of me because whenever we end up somewhere, I sort of drift off and start putting my hands in soil and feeling texture but for me, this is, we're really talking about the building block of life. We're talking about the medium through which all of the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that we depend on for life are transferred from the ground into the plants and animals that we eat. 
And for me, when we start thinking of soil in that way, it's actually a window into the health of our own communities. And when we think about waste differently, when waste has literally a new face, that soil, we're not only ensuring the vitality of that soil, we're actually ensuring the viability of our own communities. And that provides us the opportunity to really think about how do we start to transition cities like Providence, heavily industrial cities of the past, into the green cities of the future. And that's the kind of transformation I want to be a part of, and that's the kind of alchemy I want to see. Thank you.